Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation. My talk is based on joint work with Michael Paul. And as you see from the title, it's a summary related uh, to some talks in the morning. So we have a little bit different perspectives there. I would like to first give an outline of the talk. We will start with multivariate battle process. As we've seen, they can be viewed as the radial part of Dunkel processes, so they are closely related. For the multivariate battle processes, we will consider first the freezing case. Um, they are um, consider associated ODEs. Then we consider limit theorems as uh, the dimension n tends to infinity. For the limit, we uh, discuss connections to free probability. And finally, we will expand the results to Dunkel processes. Sorry. Ah, okay. Um, let me start with a brief motivation, though we've already seen a lot of uh, this in the talks in the morning. Uh, so we will consider multivariate vessel processes, which have a background in interacting particle systems. And I will here consider two types, namely the cases AN minus one and DN. And also um, we will see Dunkel processes uh, in the perspective of jump processes, as I said already, uh, as related to the vessel process, where the vessel process are the radial part of uh, the Dunkel processes and in the Dunkel processes in addition, jump occurs where the particle change position or change the sign. What I also want to stress is as motivation that the joint distribution of the components of the multivariate vessel processes taken when uh, we consider the time equal to be one corresponds to the joint distribution of the eigenvalues of random matrices. So when we consider the case AN, uh, they are related to the beta Hermite ensembles and for the BN to the uh, beta Laguerre ensembles. So we can view our results as a dynamical version of uh, the random matrix examples. And um, we will start uh, with uh, the n dimensional diffusion processes. So nothing like um, matrix value processes. We are simply on the R to the N. And what is our aim? We want to derive semicircle Marchenko Pasteur and related laws for the empirical measure when the dimension is growing as an analog on to the classical results known from random matrix theory. Before I go into details, I would like to give a general outline of the technique. So what uh, we do is we consider first the freezing limit. Sergio and Rous already discussed a little bit of it. I will uh, do it slightly different. It was nice to see a different perspective. I will do the perspective uh, from the stochastic analysis setting that we simply weight down the influence of the Brownian motion. And then we derive results for this frozen processes via recurrence relation for their moment. Then we will interpret the laws, which we get as limiting laws with the help from the transforms, which are well known from free probability, namely Stilkes and R transforms. And finally, then we can extend our results to the original stochastic setting. And here, martingale techniques play an important role. What one can observe from this outline of the technique is that the limiting law stays the same. So it's the same limiting law for the frozen process and the original process. So this means that already all information on the stochastic process is encoded in the frozen process. Let me start with some background on the generators and whale chambers of the processes we want to look at. Um, the simplest case is the case A n uh, minus one. With this one, we will um, always start. And then we will proceed to the case E n, and we see that they are closely related. So for the case A n, we have the whale chamber consisting of axes in the R to the n, which are ordered. So x1 is bigger or equal to x2 up to xn. And 
we consider the generator of the transition semi group of this form here. So what we've seen in the morning, quite abstract, uh, we did it now in a, a more a precise form, namely for this um, um, uh, wild chamber. So we have uh, the Laplacian in the beginning, which will give us our Brownian motion. And then we have the partial derivative um, and uh, this um, um, with this coefficient here and the partial derivatives will lead to a drift term in our stochastic differential equation later. What we already see is that we have here in the um, uh, denominator xi minus xj. So there may occur problems when xj approaches xi. That was too fast. So uh, to look at uh, the same thing for the whale chamber EN. Uh, here we also have the order components in the R uh, in the R2 sorry. in the R2 the N, we again have um, ordered particles, but now uh, they are uh, restricted to the positive half line. So uh, x1 is bigger or equal to x2 up to xn, which is bigger or equal to zero. And here we have the two-dimensional multiplicity k1, k2. We assume that both are bigger than zero. And again, we can write down the uh, transition semi-group explicitly. Again, we have uh, the uh, Laplacian, which gives us the Brownian motion. And then we have this term here, with first partial derivatives with the multiplicity k2. Um, you see this term here looks familiar to you from the an case. And then we have another one where one uh, over xi appears. So you see this corresponds here to the case that uh, we are a non-negative. Um, to give you a bit of background, how this is related to interacting particle systems. I would like to show you the general stochastic differential equation setting. Uh, namely, here we can have a unifying approach to the A and the B case. In this form that we view it as a stochastic differential equation, where uh, the diffusion is simply a n dimensional Brownian motion. And we have the drift term of the special form here namely as the gradient of a log potential. So you see that this is class, it's just a classical stochastic dynamical system here. And uh, this potential W is different if we consider the case A or the case B. And we have in there the repelling forces between the particles. And here the repelling forces between the particles and the repelling force from zero. As you see, this is not the standard setting for a stochastic differential equation. Since to the gradient of the logarithm of this, we get um, coefficients which are not Lipschitz continuous. Moreover, they have even singularities if, if we approach the border of the whale chamber. Nevertheless, this stochastic differential equation has a unique strong solution. And if all components of the multiplicities are big enough, namely at least one half, then we do not get any problems with um, collisions as were discussed in the morning. And we will restrict ourselves to this case where no collisions occur. So let me come to the first case to uh, the Bessel process in uh, the setting AN minus one. As I said, we want to discuss first the freezing limit. So what does this mean? That means that we want to consider when the multiplicity, I have denoted it by K, and when the matrix theory is often denoted by beta with an additional factor two, is going to infinity. So this is the inverse um, temperature. And what does this mean in our case? When we let K tend to infinity, this means we have an increasing influence of the driving Brownian motion of our stochastic process. 
So let us look at the specific case of our multidimensional diffusion process. When you think back of uh, the um, infinitesimal generator from the Laplacian, we get the Stern emission here. And from the term uh, with the first partial derivative, we get the strict term here, where we have the multiplicity in front. If we renormalize this process now by the square root of k, we get for this renormalized process again a stochastic differential equation. And the trip term, k doesn't appear anymore. And in the diffusion term, we scale it down by one over the square root of k. So you see, if we let k tend to infinity, this term vanishes and we are left with an ODE. So let us have a look at this ODE. So it's given of this form here. We have dx by dt is some function h of this form here of xt. So this is basically the building block of our dynamics now. And we can say something similar as for the stochastic differential equation. Namely, it has a unique solution for all t because equal to zero. And what is also important is and um, for t bigger than zero, a solution lives in the interior of the uh, vial chamber. We will denote the solutions of this ODE by phi n, consisting of the components phi n1 up to phi n n. And when you think back of uh, Sir John Krauss' talk, um, you remember perhaps that general solutions are quite uh, are unknown but uh, you can um, give them in special situations. And these special situations also show you the connections uh, to the beta Hermit ensembles or uh, to uh, the Hermit polynomials. When you look at one of these components here, maybe the sum looks familiar to you when you think of Hermit polynomials or zeros of Hermit polynomials. Namely, when you think of the um, famous uh, lemma by Stilkias, that the zeros of the Hermit polynomials have three equivalent characterizations in terms of the maximization problem and in terms of such uh, equality. And here, this is just what we have in these components of um, our function H. So if we use the equivalence of the um, second and the third point here, we see that if we start at a special point, namely constant C times the ordered zeros of the Hermit polynomials, we get a special solution of this ODE here. Namely just some scaling with time of the zeros of the Hermit polynomials. So if we start in zero, we just have square root of two times t times z. Okay, let us now come to our first task to consider the empirical measure. Namely, we are interested in the empirical measure of the scale solution of our ODE. So we look at an empirical measure of this form here, and we take just a general starting point xn1 up to xnn um, for the solution. As I said, we want to proceed in our proof via the moments of this empirical measure. So let us define the moment. We look at the else moment and we define it as SNL. So this is just the integral of y to the L integrated with respect to this empirical measure. So where we have to scale the solutions by the square root of n. And since this measure is so simple, we can just write it down explicitly. It's the Lth power of the sum of all the components appropriately scaled. And you see also symmetric polynomials will appear here. Namely, if we want to calculate the empirical moment, we have to calculate symmetric polynomials of our solution. So let us do so. Clearly, Sn0 is equal to 1. What about Sn1? Here we can use our ODE. If we do so, 
we end up with this formula and we see that this double sum here sums up to zero. So the first moment is very simple. It's just a constant, namely the first moment of the starting value. The second one, we can also write down. We can calculate it as a kind of polynomial division. And we end up here also with this very simple expression. And we can go on, so with the third one. And here we see again that when we calculate the third moment, the first one appears. And by induction, we can go on and derive a general formula, formula for, um, for the moments which are bigger or equal to four, that the time derivative of the else moment can be written down in this form here. What is especially important is this second term here, where we sum up products of the L minus two minus K and the K moment. Okay, remember, we are interested in the limit as n tends to infinity. So this first term here disappears and we are left with this one here. <coughs> So let us summarize the results on the following lemma. We start with a general sequence. For this sequence, we need that the empirical measure is finite and exists. Then for all n, also the limit of the moments for uh, this empirical measure mu t exists, locally uniform in t. And we can say more. Namely, it is a polynomial in degree t with degree at most uh, floor L half. And they satisfy this recurrence relation here. When you look at the sum here, this looks very similar to the Catalan number. Of course, when you're familiar with random matrix theory, that's not really surprising, since uh, there you expect that we get a semicircle law and the moments of the semicircle law are given in terms of the Catalan number. Let me just recall how the Catalan numbers are defined via a recurrence relation. We start with C0, C1, and 1, and we have this recurrence relation here. And if we compare it, to the slide before, we see that the um, even uh, polynomials to L has degree L with the L's Catalan number. And we can use this to really arrive at first semicircle law. Namely, if we assume that we start in zero, then we see that all odd moments are vanishing. The even moments are just this. And if we compare it to the semicircle law, the semicircle law has this Lebesgue density. It's um, the metric uh, density on the compact interval between minus R and R. This means that, of course, the odd moments vanish, and the even moments are given in this term with a parameter R, which is the radius here. So by the moment convergence theorem, we see that the empirical moments of our mu and t of the three normalized solutions of our ODE weakly tend to a semicircle law with parameter two times the square root of n as our dimension tends to infinity. So this is a first simple example. Of course, it works more general. If we have a condition on the moments like the Kalaman condition, this Kalaman condition on the initial um, um, a starting configuration somehow translates also to the um, measures themselves. And then we get that our mu and t tends weakly to mu t, which is given via the moments of this recurrence relation, which we had in the lemma before. OK, so we have a recurrence relation for the moments of the limiting distribution. Now the question is, how can we interpret this? If you think again of random matrix theory, there you know from the Gaussian unitary ensemble, it is well known that 
the limit is a free additive convolution of a semicircle law with the empirical measure of a secondly additive random matrix. So our conjecture is that we have the same here, that it's just the free additive convolution between our starting measure, so the measure induced by our starting points, and the semicircle law. To show this, we have to apply the techniques from free probability. First, we need the Stilkes transform. The Stilkes transform is an integral transform of this form here. So we integrate with respect to the measure over the real line, and we have a complex argument in there where the imaginary part is bigger than zero. And what we want to do now is to derive by this recurrence relation a PDE for the Stilkes transform. Why a PDE? Think of our measure. Our measure is time dependent. So actually, our Stilkes transform depends on two um, um, components, namely the time and the space variable set. And we can show that it satisfies a non viscous Burgers equation, namely that the partial derivative with respect to time is minus g times g partial derivative with respect to z. How can one see this? It's quite easy. Namely, if we do not use this integral uh, representation of the Stilkes transform, but a representation in an infinite series expansion in terms of the moments of the underlying distribution. OK, this is a very nice PDE, but it doesn't help us to interpret it as the uh, free additive convolution. For this, we need another. Um, transform from free probability, namely the R transform. So what is the R transform? That's basically a power series in terms of the free turbulence. When you think of classical probability, you have the moment and you have the cumulant. When you have independent random variables, the cumulant just sum up. And in free probability, it's the same you simply have a different kind of turbulence to use there. They are given by non-crossing partitions. But that its background is not so important here. Important is that we can relate the Stilkes transform and the R transform in this form here. And in our setting, we can simply transform the PDE for the Stilkes transform into a PDE for the R transform, namely this one here. And you see it's extremely simple. And we start in the R transform of our starting measure. So the solution is just Z times T plus the R transform of our starting measure. When you are, transform, uh, when you are familiar with uh, the semicircle law, so the semicircle law is somehow the equivalent to the normal distribution in free probability. It shares with the normal distribution the property that only the second cumulant is not equal to zero. And so this is just the um, R transform of this semicircle law here, and we get our desired result. Okay, so we have the limit, we have interpreted to the limit. Now we go back to the Bessel process. We look at the renormalized process from the beginning. We define the empirical measures of the renormalized processes as we did for the ODEs, so scaling the square root of n. And we look at the um, moments of this empirical measure. And what turns out is that if we are in the setting that we have no collision, we get the same convergence as for the ODE. So how can one see this? The idea is to consider the asymptotic behavior of the normalized moments, which has a similar behavior as the associated the ODE. Then we have to look at the diffusion part, which is new, and then we can piece both together and deduce the desired result for the normalized moments. And what we need here is just Chebyshev inequality together with Burkholder-Davis-Gandhi inequality. So here we need the Martingale technique. 
then we get convergence in probability. And finally, with the Borak and Cantelli argument, we get almost true convergence. Let us have a brief look how it works. So the basic ingredients is just the sum of the else power of our components of the multivariate Bessel process. We can use Eto's formula and obtain this formula here. So we have the starting point. We have something integrals with respect to Brownian motion. And then we have this integral with respect to time. This one should be familiar to you. This is the one we know from the ODE. When we look at the scaling with n, we see that this term here is of lower order of n. So this will vanish on the limit. So we have to take care of this diffusion term here. It's the sum of integrals with respect to n independent Brownian motion. But by Lady's characterization theory, this is in, um, distribution just the integral with respect to a new one dimensional Brownian motion. This is well behaved. So you see, this is a martingale with zero expectation. And these are more or less the basic ingredients. Okay, to sum up, just to recall the simple case that we get what we expect. If the renormalized Bessel process starts in zero, so this means we start in the direct measure, we get just our uh, limiting measure as on the semicircle law. If we are interested in the original Bessel process, we can just um, do a scaling, and the scaling factor appears again here in the parameter of our semicircle law. OK, so this was the A case. Now we can proceed with the case BN. We have the two-dimensional multiplicity. We have the stochastic differential equation here. And as you see, it looks a bit more complicated, but the structure is the same. And we can also proceed similarly here. What I have to say is that we look at a special structure of the multiplicity, as Sergio also did it namely uh, that one is mu times theta and the other is theta and we let again theta tend to infinity. So we rescale the process, which means that we get rid of the thetas here. We scale down the Brownian motion and we are again left with an ODE. And also here it's, it's very similar, uh, not the zeros of the Hermite polynomials pop up, but the zeros of the Laguerre polynomials was an um, order depending on our parameter nu here. So everything looks quite nice. And maybe you think we are done, but it's not as easy. Namely, if we have the problem, if we work with the process itself and we come to the polynomial divisions for calculating the um, empirical moments, we see it doesn't work. For the odd moments, uh, we get a remainder and it doesn't work. The solution is pass to the squares. Maybe that's also not surprising to you when you think of random matrix theory there in the Laguerre case who also consider the squares. Okay, so let us do so. We look at the moment of the ODE. So as I said, we look at the squares. So we normalize it a bit differently. Of course, then we do not have the square root of n, but n. And we also take an additional factor two here, namely to be able to compare our results to the case of uh, the Hermite setting. So again, as before, we denote our else moment by SNL, which is just the two else power now of the sum of our components appropriately scaled. And now we can derive a similar recurrence relation. And we see it has a very similar structure as in the case AN. And the term here is a bit different. But nevertheless, it looks very similar. So here we will consider two cases, namely the first case when our new 
this parameter from one of our multiplicities is fixed, of course, bigger than zero. Then we get this recurrence relation for the limiting moment. And we see it's the same as for the even moments in our A case. So the limiting distribution can be written down in this form here. So the modulus of what we had before, when we consider the right starting measure, namely a symmetrization of our starting measure. So what does this mu even mean? That's just the unique even probability measure on R when we start with the measure on the positive real line as we do since we are in the Lebesgue case, uh, since we are in the Laguerre case, uh, such that modulus of mu even is back this measure mu. So what does this mean in uh, the simplest case? If we start in zero, this just means that we get a quarter circle law on the positive half line as limiting distribution. What can we do in general? So second case, we have now mu depending on n in such a way that mu n divided by n is some new naught. Then we can also use uh, the um, a recurrence relation for our Sn to derive the limit for the CLT of this form here. So this one is as before, and we get an additional term here with a new naught. Before we can say what this means, we have to recall the Marchenko Pasteur law. We've already seen it this morning. It's the probability measure on the positive um, half line, also compacted supported. And if this first parameter is bigger or equal to zero, that's the case we are interested in, it has a Lebesgue density of this form here. What we also need is the R transform of the Marchenko Pasteur distribution. It has this form. So we have a two parameter family with C and T. And we see that the R transform is linear in C. So this means that if we freely additive convolute to Marchenko Pasteur law, where the second parameter is the same, it's again a Marchenko Pasteur law where the two parameters sum. And that's something we need in the following. So let us look at the general case. We look at the normalized empirical measure. Now we are back to uh, the process itself and not the square. And we can see that it weakly tends to the square root of Marchenko Pasteur with parameter nu naught and t, really additive convoluted with the square of the semicircle law, really additive convoluted with nu even. So this may look a bit odd to you. When you think of random matrix theory, you would expect that you get simply a Machenko Pasteur. But that's not so far away. When you think of random matrix theory, there you look at the squares. So this means the square root disappears. You start in zero. So this means this one here disappears. And the square of a semicircle is again a Machenko Pasteur. And then you sum up two Marchenko Pasteurs and you have your Marchenko Pasteur. Okay, so this doesn't contradict uh, the other cases. How can we get this result? And this result may be deduced as in the AN case by a PDE for the R transform. So from our moment recurrence relation, we can derive a PDE for the Sirius transform, and from this we can derive a PDE for the R transform, which has this form here. You, so you see it looks much more complicated than in the AN case. Nevertheless, it's not hopeless since we know a lot. For the case mu equal to naught, we already know that 
this is the solution. We know the R transform of the general Marchenko Pasteur, so we can simply calculate that this is the solution of this PDE, and we are done. Okay, to wrap up this, consider now the process again. We need that we do not have collision. Again, we have to assume something on the starting point, and then we see that indeed we get the same result as we got for the ODE setting. So nothing surprising, idea of the proof is of the same as in the AN case. Now let us come to the interesting case, namely the extension to Dunker processes. As Michael Foyt said in the moment, uh, in the morning, of course, the uh, case uh, for the uh, Bethel A and case is known when you look in the book of uh, Guyonet et al, for example, you see it there, only the proofs are slightly different. But now we are going to extend this uh, to our Dunkel processes, which um, is something new. So as I said at the beginning, Dunkel processes are jump diffusion. So we have jumps, jumps which are very special. Namely, the jumps exchange the coordinates or they change the sign of the coordinates. It's differently for the two cases A and B. So for the case A n minus one, only the first kind of jumps occur, namely the particles only um, permutate. So they all exchange only the coordinates. When you think of our techniques, they are based on just summing up power of all of our components. So it doesn't matter if particles change. So this is no influence. So the derived limit theorems stay the same. So we get them for free. We do not have to do anything. The interesting case is the BN case. Here we have additional random sign changes, and this will lead to new limit theorems for the empirical measure. So as before, we consider our two-dimensional multiplicity of this form here that we have beta and mu beta. And in this case, we get for the renormalized Dunkel process the following generator. So we have this weighted Laplacian, since we're in the renormalized case, and we get this uh, operator L nu here, which we will see on the next page. Namely, this one will uh, correspond to the frozen Dunkel process. It has the following generator. So here we have again the first partial derivative. And this form here is the one we know from the better process in the BN case. I simply summed up the uh, um, the um, separated um, terms uh, as I had before. And then we have two additional new parts in here. The one with our multiplicity new and another one independent of it where the reflections come in. So here we have sigma i and the sigma i means that we change the sign in the i-th coordinate. Then we have here the sigma ij. This means that we exchange the i's and the j's coordinate. And then we have sigma ij minus. This means that we exchange the co coordinates and we also exchange the signs of this coordinate. If you think of our theory, then it's obvious that this term is not interesting for us since here we only uh, change the coordinates. So in the end, we are left with this three terms here. What we have to note that unless in the case of the Bessel processes, our frozen Dunkel process is still random. 
So for the battle process, we had something deterministic, an ODE. But for the Dunkel process, the frozen process is still random, namely the jumps are still there. When you think of Bertrand Charles' talk, he told us that we have the battle process and uh, then a Poisson process, which is somehow driven by this battle process. So this means we have two sources of randomness, Brownian motion, which is driving the battle process, and a Poisson process. And basically, this means here, this one source of randomness, this Poisson process is still there. OK. So nevertheless, we try to follow the same route as before. So we consider our renormalized frozen battle process. We look at the normalized empirical measure. Here we do the normalization as in the AN case, just with the square root of n. We define our corresponding moments. And what we see immediately, if, if we have even moments, the moments are deterministic because then our sign changes and the jumps uh, vanish. And what we have to do is now, again, we look at functions which are the sum of the else power of the components. So we can write with this function ul just our empirical moments in a compact form of this one here. And you see this ul as it is defined here as invariant anti permutations of coordinates. So as I said before, for this special u, we are left with this operator here. So consisting of the one which corresponds to the better process and the one with the sign changes. Now we can use Duncan's formula for Markov processes and see that u of l of the process minus u of l of the starting value minus the time integral of this operator applied to the process as a martingale. As a special case, what you know as a Dunkel process is the martingale itself. And from this, we can deduce the following differential equation in terms of expectations. We need the expectations since we have a random process. So this is then the analog to the ODE in our battle case. And now we can follow the same routes as before. We want to derive a recurrence relation for the moment. And here we can again proceed via polynomial division. So magically here, even if we are in the blue case, suddenly polynomial division works. So the jumps of the Dunkel process give the missing terms from the Bessel process. And we can um, derive the, um, um, uh, the recurrence relations for the moment. But we get different ones now for the odd moments and the even moments. So for the odd moments, we get this formula here. So you see, again, we have something summing up even and odd moments. But we somehow have to weight them with the index L minus H. So L is here the index from our moment, H is the summation index. And here, this is not a typo that there's no expectation. Remember that the even moments are deterministic, so we do not need an expectation there. And in the, the even case, we get this formula here. So everything is deterministic. And when you compare it to the DN case, it looks very similar except that we have a factor two here. But when you think of our scaling, we did a different scaling in uh, the Bessel case. So uh, this is more or less the same. OK, so we can also formalize this on the following lemma, that if uh, we start an appropriate starting sequence, uh, we uh, get as um, 
a recurrence relation for our limiting moments the following. So we start with C0 and 1. C1 um, of T is C1 of 0. And then we have to divide between uh, the even and the odd moments. So to describe the limiting law, we have to introduce a reflected probability measure. Maybe that's not surprising when you think of uh, the structure of the Dunkel processes that you also have reflections uh, there um, with the root. So we define mu star t, which is just mu uh, t of minus a for Borel set. And with this reflected probability measures, we can define even and odd probabilities. So strictly speaking, this mu t odd is normally not a measure, but only a signed measure. But anyway, this doesn't matter here. So we have this mu t even and mu t odd as one half mu t uh, plus mu t star or minus for the odd one. And if we sum up both, we get our measure. So from I'm this mu t even and mu t 46 minutes, sorry. 46 ah, minutes sorry. of your talk. So we have still four minutes. Uh, the questions included. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, um, we can uh, use these two measures to derive associated circuit transforms. We can derive a, a system of quasi linear PDEs for this T odd and G even. And what we see in the end is if we start in an even probability matter, this G odd is vanishing and we are left with uh, the even one. So in the frozen Dunkel process, which starts in a symmetric measure, we get a two-sided version of the law for the corresponding Bessel process. So the uh, jumps keep the symmetry of the starting measure. What is really interesting is uh, the uh, asymmetric case. And this is something we cannot interpret as in terms of um, uh, um, uh, free probability. Nevertheless, we can solve the system of um, uh, Stiltius transforms. It looks a bit complicated. We need something like an inverse of this um, Stiltius transform here. For the special case, mu equal to zero, it gets a bit simpler. Then we get a Stiltius transform of this form here. So we have the Stiltius transform of the semicircle law convoluted with mu even. Then we have the inverse and have to apply the Stiltius transform again. And um, what's something nice maybe to conclude is we can give an uh, example here and see that uh, the asymmetry from uh, the starting value uh, is not kept in the long term behavior, it's vanishing. So for uh, nu equal to one, and if we start in a quarter um, circle distribution on zero two, we can calculate uh, this explicit uh, with the uh, explicit form of the Stiltius transform, the um, probability density. And if we rescale it, then we get this nice picture here. So if we start with a quarter circle law, and as time involves, more and more mass is going also to the negative line. So this dotted here, that's the case for t equal 100. And in the limiting case, t equal to infinity, we get the semicircle law back. OK, thank you very much. Thank you for this very interesting talk. We have one minute for questions first from the conference room. Are there questions, comments? I have a question. What would happen if you do not freeze with beta going to infinity, uh, the Bessel process in the meaning of radial Dunkel process? Can you find uh, the limiting distribution for statistical empirical distribution of lambdas? Uh, yeah, the freezing is only a technique. We do not need it. 
um, uh, in the end. So uh, we just use uh, the freezing to derive uh, somehow uh, the uh, the dynamics of uh, of the limiting distribution. But in the end, this works uh, for fixed k. If beta is not infinity. Yeah, it, it, it works for general beta. So, um, for example, when and you look the here at uh, the theorem, the yeah, the limit is the same. Okay, because we tried to solve such question with Jacek Majewski for BN system with the methods he presented this morning, but but we didn't manage. So, congratulations. Yeah, the, the idea is to, uh, also to, use for beta the, not infinity. to use the renormalized process. Okay. Uh, are there questions from virtual participants? Uh, Vadim uh, uh, Gorin, uh, can you ask your question, please? Yes, hello. So, uh, for the Besson case, there are many connections to the random matrix theory. So, this dynamics is like projection to eigenvalues of uh, dynamics of Brownian motions on matrices. Is there any connection to random matrix theory for these Dunkel processes? Can it be seen through any random matrices? I don't know, at least to my knowledge, not, but uh, I think I'm not the expert there. <laughs> Maybe that's a question to uh, to the audience. Okay. Yes, please, there's another question. No, as far as I know, there are no connections. So that's generally for the Dunkel processes, uh, this jumps, we don't have interpretations in random matrix theory up to now, as far as I know. Would be interesting if one could, somebody could find such connections. There may be spin models, but I don't know. Yeah. So uh, we still have one more question from Makoto Katori. Makoto, can you ask your question? Yes, sir. can I back to the um, page 19, your slide? Page 19. Yes. Yes, so I, I, I'm very interested in the, uh, this equation, uh, right? In the uh, equation uh, in the, Third line from the bottom. Um, this one. RT, no, no, below one. This one. Yes, this one. How did you get this equation? Uh, is it a very, very long? No, it's it's simply solving this PDE. So it's the transformation uh, uh, of uh, of the R transform is equal yes. to Z. We know that we start in R zero set, and then it's just uh, it's just simple, simply solving. Oh, so you got this uh, solving the uh, Burgers yeah, equation. This, uh, yeah, this no, the PDE, equations were yeah, our this, equations. This trivial PDE. Yeah, so you, do you know this is the uh, result of the free asymptotic freedom of the. Yes. yes? Okay. So how about the uh, page 31? Can, can you go to the th page 31 for the. Yes, uh, equation 22. How did you get? This equation. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Just I don't, this one. Yes. Uh, this is uh, simply uh, using uh, the recurrence relation to derive uh, the circuit transform, as in the AN case, and then uh, to use uh, the known relation between uh, the circuit and the R transform, such that you can transform the sorry. Uh, the mm. uh, circuit transform in the R transform, and then you get this PDE here. Uh -huh. So in this uh, equation, you didn't uh, solve this 22 equation to get the solution. Uh, yes, uh, I didn't solve it explicitly. I, um, I used what I know from my first case. So the first case was when u naught is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Then you are left with this PDE here. And by comparing uh, our moments uh, to um, 
uh, to the uh, Hermite case, we know that this one solves the equation with uh, new vanishing. And then one can use that one knows uh, the Stokes transform of the Marchenko Pasteur and a simple calculation that uh, then uh, this sum uh, is the solution of this uh, PDE here. Mm -hmm. So you got this very special solution. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not solving it, uh, but it's using everything you know about it uh, to, uh, to verify that this is a solution. Okay. So um, one, it is one, one uh, comment that you said that you call this uh, process, uh, uh, many particle process, a Bessel process, but usually you use the Bessel process at the uh, different uh, meaning. So sometimes we use the uh, call this process a uh, Blue Richard process or a Lagarde process in random matrix theory. So I think it's better. Uh, but isn't a Richard process something which is living in a ma matrix space? Yeah, but uh, in the free probability theory, is, they say it's a free Bichet process or something like that. This process is the one-dimensional diffusion process, different from the multivariate processes or free probability processes. It is uh, just a comment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, perhaps the best would be to say dunkel bessel process or, or radial dunkel bessel process. <laughs> But saying doing uh, better, we think about one dimension or positive halfway. So thank you very much for all participants of this discussion. I recall you that there is a possibility of organizing a discussion with the speaker at the BBB rooms. Uh, I think for Makoto tonight will be too late, but uh, it may be tomorrow. Would you be interested, Makoto, uh, uh, yes, it's of <laughs> organizing such a session, but tomorrow? at the moment when yes. Makoto can be present. So we will try to do it by email. Thank it's you very much. 11 o'clock in Tokyo. <laughs> yes. Tomorrow, 11 o'clock in yeah. Tokyo. Okay, we will try. Thank you very much. And we switch to the next speaker, who, who is Kilian.